The Parkinson House, built in 1850 by William Kenton Parkinson. I am pleased to introduce Marcia Parkinson Gray, who during this first hour will tell you the story of the Parkinson House, located in Barclay Township of Jasper County. She represents the third generation of Parkinson's that were born in this home. She was once introduced as being from a fine old Jasper County family. How true. I can think of no way to be better known. So, it is my pleasure to introduce Marcia. Of course, from a fine old Jasper County family. Marcia? That introduction makes me feel like I should be looking for my sunbonnet and my apron. The Parkinson House is very dear to me. It's my birthplace and the place I spent my important growing up years. It is also the birthplace of three generations of Parkinson's, beginning with my grandfather, Robert Addison, or Little Ab as he was known. To me, it is a symbol of the past and the people who came before to pioneer Jasper County. Their mark is apparent in many ways yet today. There are many people with the Parkinson, Kenton, lineage in the county today, like Henry's, Hermanson's, Spangles, Claps, Gratner's, Rison's, Long's, Johnson's, Lewandowski's, Paul's, Yeoman's, Rhodes, Parkinson, Zobel, Dowd's, and Gray. Some of these people may even be surprised to know that they are related to me, but 160 years and seven generations touches many lives. I have tried to acquaint you with the people who came before and in so doing show how and why the house came into being and the purpose it has served these hundred plus years. John Graham Parkinson was, came to Jasper County in 1836 with his longtime friend Henry Barclay. He purchased 160 acres for which he paid $300. Henry Barclay purchased adjoining land and the two families worked together to build the community. John G. Parkinson was born in Mason County, Kentucky in 1793. While he was still very young, his parents moved to what was then called the Mad River Country in Ohio, near Urbana. He grew to manhood in Ohio, and he participated in the War of 1812 and experienced many of the Indian uprisings which were so prevalent in, in that day. After the war, he manufactured hats in Urbana for some time. In 1817, he married Matilda Kenton, daughter of General Simon Kenton, who was the renowned Indian scout, revolutionary soldier, scout for George Rogers Clark, and a frontiersman of many talents, who contributed much to the history of Kentucky, Ohio, Tennessee, and later in Indiana through the Parkinson's. General Kenton is buried in Oakdale Cemetery in Urbana, Ohio. There is a monument there that proclaims his accomplishments. It was designed by the sculptor John Quincy Adams Ward, but not completed because of a lack of funds. There is a, now a plan to complete the original as planned. It will be dedicated in April of 1997. So if you plan to lay claim to Kenton blood, I advise you to wait until after that as they are in need of a very large sum.
Simon Kenton married Elizabeth Jarbo of a French aristocratic family. She was really a well-educated woman for the time, and she contributed much to her family and her friends. She accompanied John G. and her eldest daughter, Matilda, to Indiana when they moved soon after the general's death, following a long illness. Typical of the time, we do not have a picture of Mrs. Kenton, but we have a description given by Matilda, her daughter. She was tall, very fair of complexion, blue eyes, and dark hair. No wonder I always thought I should be tall and willowy. According to Matilda, she was dressed in calico with a joseph, or a short riding dress, of brown casimir with green spots over it and a, great, and a green satin bonnet. This was after Kenton's death and the many hardships that she had endured, but she remained dignified and stylish. The descendants of Simon and Elizabeth Jarbo Kenton and John and Matilda Kenton Parkinson take great pride in having descended from them. Here you see a marker erected by Elizabeth's descendants at the site of the heretofore unmarked gravesite of Mrs. Kenton. Here are the three present living generations, myself, son James Kenton Gray, and grandson Sean Kenton Gray, shown at the Parkinson Cemetery. My line of the family has preserved the name Kenton in five of the six generations since Matilda Kenton Parkinson, beginning with her son, William Kenton Parkinson, then skipping a generation with my grandfather, Robert Addison, Then we picked it up again in my father, William Kenton Parkinson. And carried it on again with my brother, Thomas Kenton Parkinson. Then the line is carried on with my contribution of James Kenton Gray and his son, Sean Kenton Gray, the hammy one, and his brother, a good Irish kid, Michael Patrick Gray. The descendants of John and Matilda are grateful to them for having put down roots in this county. The early generations remained pretty close until World War I and the Depression made it impossible for the farm families to exist as they had for many years. My mother used to say that she knew my dad was truly a pioneer. He'd go anywhere in the world and do anything that was needed to do as long as he could be back in his own bed at night. This is, this is true of most of the family that I have known.
On this knoll, John G. built his first cabin. George Johnson, who has farmed it many years, has some artifacts from it. He says that there is a soft spot in the draw, which indicates to him that there was a spring there at one time, which they used as their water source. Also, there is no evidence of any well in the vicinity. The Parkinson Cemetery nearby, with its wrought iron fence and the name plate, indicate the affluence of the family. John G. and his sons, W.K. and Ad, began to build a herd of good stock in their early years here. It was quite a step for manufacturing hats. A New York businessman and entrepreneur, Harvey Edwards, met the Parkinson brothers while he was on a hunting trip to Indiana. Their enterprising attitude evidently intrigued him. He struck up a deal with them to purchase and deliver cattle to New York. He would furnish the money and they would uh, travel around and purchase cattle. At one time, he gave them $17,000 cash. They traveled to Missouri, bought cattle, and started to New York. The round trip took six months. It was slow and dangerous. They covered only a few miles a day. Farmers along the way provided lodging for the men and safekeeping for the cattle. This was the beginning of the first great cattle venture of this area. It in introduced a type of production that made Jasper County famous as the cattle country of Indiana. The Parkinson brothers were said to have been the first to drive a herd across the Niagara Bridge. In 1843, William K. Parkinson and Mary Waters Barclay, daughter of Henry, Henry, longtime friend of and neighbor, were married. They settled on the farm and were the parents of nine children. Their firstborn, John Graham, was killed in the Civil War in 1864. The next three died young. The last five grew to childhood to adulthood, married and settled on Jasper County Farms. Those five were George Barkley, Harvey Edward, James Robb, and their only daughter, Mary Jane, and and Robert Addison, my grandfather, born in 1861. They built the house that was to house three more generations of Parkinson's and is still standing staunchly the 63 years since the Parkinson's left it. It has changed very little structurally since it was built. These two paintings by Flo Harris Pryor, a Rensselaer artist, made in 1916 gave a very clear idea of what it was originally.
the snap the snap shows it after 1921 when the house was raised in a full basement dug for a furnace to be installed and a force pump with a storage tank to supply water to the kitchen and the small bathroom off the kitchen. In 1933, the porch was added. The house was built to accommodate a large family, plus the farm and household help that was needed. The rooms are not unusual, but they're serviceable for the family's purposes. This painting, done in 1966, is as the house appears today. My brothers and I all were born in the room in the lower right-hand corner. I have the doubtful distinction of being the last person born there and also the last living one. We are now approaching the Parkinson House as it is today. Mr. and Mrs. Avery Lewis now own and reside in the house and delight my heart because they have affection and interest in the house as I do. Come with me up the lane and we'll tour the outside in my memory. The house was built to accommodate a large family, plus the farm and household help, out of, who out of necessity lived in the house. A living room on the east and a bedroom on the west make up the front. Outside entrances were there for both rooms. The living room originally had a fireplace with cupboards on either side. Later, we'll see them and learn their status today. Parkinson's never discard anything. They store it, and then they paint it, and they paint it, and they paint it. The rock from for this porch was gathered from the farm and uh, incorporated in the porch when it was built in 1933. And I might add, back of the living room, a small room doubling as a bedroom and sewing room. My grandmother had a seamstress who came several times a year to make new clothes for the family and mend and repay, repair old clothes and household linens. This was her headquarters. The dining room expanded the breadth of the house, and it was the heart of the house always. W.K. installed a post office in the east end. There was a back door convenient to the barn lot for post office customers to enter, pick up their mail, and there were always extra places on the table for anyone who wanted to come for the, who came for their mail at the same time there was a meal being served. That tradition and being a good place to stop on a two-day cattle drive from Rensselaer to Francisville gave it the name of Halfway House. On, on to the kitchen, which was not large for all the food that I know was prepared there. A few built-in cupboards, kitchen cabinet, small work table and sink, and the big old four-hole wood-burning stove. It had a reservoir which furnished us hot water for the sink and the small bathroom off the kitchen. Drinking water was always supplied from the 
from a bucket in, in the kitchen, which came from the well. Cold water came from the faucet. Cold cistern water came from the faucets supplied from the storage tank and the hot, hot from the reservoir. Needless to say, you did not fill the tub and languish in lots of hot water, especially if my brothers knew it, as they were responsible for pumping the water and carrying in the wood to heat the stove and heat the reservoir. They counted every pump stroke and every stick of wood it took to fill the wood box and every stroke to fill the tank. Had they spent as much time pumping and carrying as they did arguing, they would have wrought wonders. Out of the kitchen, into the cleverly dubbed back room, with storage shelves and so on. It had a it led to the back door and to the door of the woodshed, which made it hard to carry, handy to carry wood there in bad weather. There was, once was a door on the side that led to the, directly to the clothesline. Or as you left the kitchen on the, on the left, a door led to the basement or a ladder on the landing led to the attic. A wonderful place, not only for the Parkinson treasures, but a great place for a playhouse or a pirate's lair, depending on who was bossing that day, Tom or myself. The basement housed the furnace and the pump and cupboards for canned food and large bins for winter storage for fruit and vegetables. Upstairs were four bedrooms three large enough for two double beds. Sleeping room was always available for whatever, whoever needed it. Closets and storage for clothes were not the priority that we give them today in our modern houses. They were shallow, mostly with just hooks. They didn't have very many clothes, I guess, so they didn't need as much as we think we need today. Downstairs, there was a storage closet which opened off the dining room, created by the stairway. It was a deep, dark place and not my favorite place to look for something. One of the modern facilities of Halfway House was the milk house, more elaborate than most of the time. It had tanks of three levels. Different sized jars and cans were kept, kept the milk and the cream and the butter cold. And in the deepest one, oh, you could put luscious green watermelons. Water ran through it continuously from the tank when the windmill ran, and then it ran on out to the horse tank so that the water served several purposes. It was a lovely place in summer to sit and with the old dasher churn in the tank, one hand on the dasher and one hand on the latest magazine or a book which was good for at least one short story, or maybe two on a hot day. Tom and I fought over the who got to churn, and I really hated it when we got a modern daisy churn and it took both hands and you couldn't hold a magazine. The milk house was also the home of the crank separator, which separated the cream from the milk, and the cream was kept for household use was great and mashed potatoes and cream gravy and, and some non-caloric things. The excess cream was saved in a large can and sold once a week to the cream man who came through the country. The milk went to calves and pigs and uh, the barn, many barn cats. I can shut my eyes and mentally assemble that beast. It was washed and scalded every day dried and put back together. Woe be unto one who would reassemble it wrong. And the milk went into the cream jar, and the calves and pigs had the luscious cream. It did nothing for your popularity.
the windmill, now gone, was so important to uh, our lives. It supplied the water so essential to the lives of the people and the animals. Once again, on windless days, my hapless brothers had to pump on really long periods of wind, wind, lack of wind. Granddad came out from town to spell them and be sure that the animals were watered. They came almost before the people. To this day, I love the sulfur water, which most people hate. There you have the general plan of the house and some of the features of it and the part that it played in the lives of the generations who followed William K. and Mary. This is a tool shed that presently stands here and it's in the location of the three previous barns which we will have pictures of later and uh, in connection with the underground rail road. And in the distance you can see uh, the knoll where John G. Parkinson built his first cottage. So you can see that it's, we're not really too far away where William K. located from his father's house. And this is the old scale house. It was a great place to climb and also originally they weighed cattle and and hogs and anything that they were taking to market in this house. W.K. Parkinson was always active in community and county affairs. He was largely responsible for the subscri subscription school and for support to the circuit ministers and later to the organized church. He served as township trustee and county commissioner for 12 years. As mentioned, he created the post office in his home. Though he was past the age to serve in the Civil War, he was active in any war effort, especially in helping fill the quota of recruits for the township. His eldest son, John Graham, enlisted in 1862 in the Union Army and was killed in action May the 10th, 1864 at Rocky Face, Georgia. He, William K. was a staunch abolitionist and he became active in the UGRR. By the 1850s, slavery had become an important topic of discussion. Since its early territorial days, Indiana had had a pro-anti-slavery sentiment within its borders. The pro-slavery sentiment was especially strong in the southern counties of the state. However, here in Jasper County, the population was also divided on the issue. Generally speaking, the state had little sympathy for blacks which was further evidenced by the provision in the Constitution of 1851 prohibiting the race from coming within its borders. There was also a state law restricting colored people from testifying in court in any case involving a white person. 
The anti-slavery forces, however, were becoming more active and started demanding certain rights for the blacks. The Methodists, the Quakers, and the Friends churches resolved to condemn slavery in all forms and took an active part in condemning the practice. One great organization, which had been in existence for some years, was to become more important as far as the welfare of the blacks were concerned. This was the UGRR, as it was abbreviated, the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad was not actually what its name might imply. It was a system for protecting runaway slaves who had managed to escape from their owners into the border of free states. Abolitionists in the northern states would conceal these fugitives during the day and at night would carry them farther north to other sympathizers. This became so organized that it soon developed into an effective system. The Underground Railroad was in operation for about 40 years before the Civil War and after 1850 its stockholders braved the dangers of a strict fugitive slave law both on the national and state levels. The railroad operated until 1863 when the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect. Its principal field of operation was in the states bordering on the Ohio River, Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. Kentucky, though a slave state, had some inhabitants who opposed slavery. Levi Coffin's two-story brick house in Newport, now Fountain City, is known historically as the Central Union Station of the UGRR. Here, Levi, between 1827 and 1847, sheltered more than 2,000 slaves and from there sent them to freedom in Canada. Coffin was known as the president of the railroad. There were conductors, stations, and station agents. The expenses came from contributions of the stockholders and from the pockets of the agents. The slaves were hidden by day and transported by night. Food and clothing for the fugitives were furnished by the agents and also contributed by the community. Oftentimes the ill were treated by a local doctor that was in sympathy with the cause. There were three major routes of the Underground Railroad through Indiana. The Western Route, the Central Route, and the Eastern Route. The one that came to Rensselaer, the, the slaves crossed the river at Evansville, moved on to Terre Haute, to Bloomingdale, to Crawfordsville, to Burlington, and on to Rensselaer. From here, they went on north to Canada. They had alternate routes also that they called detours, but the dark black lines were the main routes in Indiana. Great-grandfather William Kenton Parkinson was an agent for the railroad. The slaves crossed the Ohio River at Evansville and were transfer transported at night, mainly in covered grain wagons, through a series of stations until they reached his farm in Barclay Township. There would be a gentle rap on the door in the middle of the night. The slaves were fed, clothed, and the ill were treated. They rested during the daytime hours to be ready for the next day's journey northward. William Kenton Parkinson was active in the Underground <coughs> Railroad, but in a close-knit community, this secret was difficult to keep. His barn was burned down twice by Southern sympathizers and the house was set afire once. However, these flames were extinguished before they could do much harm. Here you see the barn that replaced the first two that were destroyed by fire. It was an exact replica of the original buildings. <clears throat> The 
The hay mow had three levels and usually was well filled. I know it was a great place for kids to hide, so why not slaves? There was also a corn crib and grain bin off the feet, wide feedways and deep mangers on either side. It was here that the fugitives were hidden during the day. This barn was also consumed by fire in the 1950s after the Presbyterian Church owned it. The following night, Mr. Parkinson would load the blacks in a wagon and travel west to the first northbound road, still known to many of us old-timers as Canada Lane. They would travel, oftentimes under armed guard, and sprinkle their tracks with red pepper, which in turn would throw off the scent of the pursuing hounds. It, was, it went on to Michigan City and north into Canada and freedom. Have you ever wondered where the saying, high on the hog, came from? Land owners in the south would eat the chops, and the slaves were left to savor the bony pieces. Thus, eating high on the hog. We are now tracing the trail west that Agent Parkinson would have followed from his barn lot and lane to the road known as Canada Lane which offered a straight shot to Canada and freedom. While we are in our modern car, only spend a few minutes co covering the ground, we should remember that they were in a green wagon with horses pulling it, traveling on very poor dirt roads in ice, snow, rain, or intense heat and drought. Remember, there were no lights, and they could not have used them had they been available. They were, there was likely dense foliage near the road with hidden dangers, like bounty hunters, bloodhounds, or a neighbor who was a southern sympathizer. The dangers were certainly many, but the and was worth it if the blacks were sent on to freedom. We're now turning on to what was known by the old timers as Canada Lane and heading north on the road to a better life. William Kenton and Mary Barclay Parkinson continued to live in the house that they had built until their death, in eight, his death in 1888 and hers in 1892. In 1883, Robert Addison, my granddad, married Mary Ellen Rogers, and they moved in with his parents, and he assumed the management of the farm and cattle operation. They added seven children to the old house, my dad being the oldest. In 1908, my dad, fresh from Ames and four years of ag school, where he had specialized in animal husbandry and especially in livestock judging and breeding and building a good herd of cattle, returned to the farm. Kenton married Bess Hardy, and they added the third generation to the house's record.
Operations continued much as they had until the late 1920s and early 30s when part of the farm and the house were sold and we moved. Though my dad never was acti actively involved in the cattle business, he never lost the interest and inbred love he had for it. As a snap taken not long before his death in 1961 shows him viewing a few cattle that he had recently bought to feed and market. You have met the Parkinson family and his house. I thought maybe you'd like to see some of the tangible, tangible reminders that I live with every day and enjoy that have touched the lives of those that you have met. Each has its own story. Some came to me by default because my, I moved into my grandmother and granddad's house. Or some of them came to me because nobody else thought they wanted them. The Simon Kenton Bowl, the only thing we have from Elizabeth and Simon's home, which she brought when she came to Indiana. All my life, it's been in my grandmother Parkinson's china cabinet, where it still resides. It has come down the generations to me and is now earmarked, you guessed it, for Kenton Gray, and then for Sean Kenton Gray, which means that eventually it will travel like Simon and go to Boston. This little marble top table had always stood in the chimney corner in the house. Recently, when we had occasion to turn the marble over, we discovered the address John G. Parkinson, Rensselaer. I was delighted. I'd always thought that it belonged to my grandmother, and to find out that it really belonged to John did my heart good. Remember the cupboards I mentioned? Here they are reposing in my basement with odds and ends after traveling from the country house to 448, where they served for many years in the pantry. Then they were moved to the kitchen. And once again, the dreaded Parkinson paintbrush. I stripped the doors when they were encased in our kitchen paneling. Then when the second remodeling occurred, they went to the basement for storage. Here is the last remaining bit of the post office from W.K.'s dining room. It has served me all my life as a bookcase and then my children's bookcase. It too has run the gamut of popular paint. It's been stripped, but it's not a very good wood, so we painted it, painted it again. Simon Kenton and this Seth Thomas clock keep perfect time up on our bookcase as long as Hal remembers to wind it every day. It came from the William, Parkes, William K. Parkinson house and was resurrected from one of the Parkinson attics in later years. Would you believe that when this was brought out of the basement after many years, what a mess it was, black and battered. Dad told someone as far as he was concerned they could have it unless Marcia wanted it. And, of course, Marcia did. My brother Bob took one look and said, Sis, it's a hopeless junk. Brothers are really comforting. I scrubbed and did all the things I could to get it clean. With seal wool, brushes, wire brushes, to no avail. Finally, I took it to be burnished, and here you see the result. It has served in my mother's house as a magazine rack and a planter, and now it serves in my house as a magazine holder. It's headquarters for my granddaughter's wish books. She refers to it as that big, round, shiny thing. 
Mother and my grandmother both remembered having stirred apple butter in it over an open fire. It was a wedding gift to W.K. and Mary Barclay Parkinson. It was brought to them on the back of a covered wagon in 1843, all the way from Ohio. These next two pieces came from the house to us when tenants lived in halfway house. The little table held a water bucket in my childhood until we got fancy and had a shelf built. It was then refinished and has been a part of our furnishings for many years. And the pie safe, my mother had a heyday with her paintbrush, even or especially on the tin and its starred pattern. After a struggle, Ken Robinson rescued me at the strip joint. You can still see some paint on the inside, but I enjoy it anyway in my kitchen. Hal keeps hoping I'll fill it with pies. My very favorite of all is this walnut, walnut rope bed. It had been stored in the attic of the Parkinson house for many years, it, and it originally came from William and Mary. When I was born, my dad claimed it for me. It, it spent some more years in the attic until the 1940s when I sanded and rubbed it with linseed oil. I had rails made, angle irons, and spatial spring and mattress made. When I took it to the shop for the rails and the angle irons, the man looked at it and said, Ma'am, don't you want me to cut those knobs off when I'm Miss Split? And I suggested gently I would shoot him if he did. My grandmother remembered tightening the ropes and plumping the feather bed in it when she was first when she first lived at the Parkinson farm. As you see it now, it's waiting for a new mattress and spring. When Earl Barclay Sr. learned I was doing the bed, he offered me this dresser. He thought it fitting to have a Parkinson Barclay bed with, with a Barclay dresser to go with it. I sanded it and rubbed it too. We have traveled with the Parkinson's from 1836 to 1996. Many of those years, some of the family lived in halfway house. Some of the original land is still owned by John G.'s descendants. Betty Dunn Johnson, Ann Parkinson Brettel, Barbara Parkinson, and Kathy Parkinson. The Presbyterian Church puts the land to good use. And as I mentioned before, Mr. and Mrs. Lewis live in the house and enjoy it. Though there are those, there are no longer descendants engaged in farming and livestock production as in past generations, there are still some of us who fit the old saying, you can take the girl out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the girl. Hal and I have enjoyed doing this, and we hope you have enjoyed it with us. Thank you for watching and listening. You've heard of having the last word. Well, this is it. Just after we finished making this uh, video, my friend and historian, Beulah Arnott, called me with this bit of interesting news that I thought you would like to hear and would add to tonight's 
um, discussion. In researching the, the uh, papers of General Milroy, she found these letters, this letter from Mary Milroy to her husband, dated September the 6th, 1863. Conwell was just here and says the butternuts burned Billy Parkinson's barn last night. All contents, his hay, grain, four horses, and a colt and a new wagon and harness were burned. Fire was put to the house, but the family waked in time to save it. As I mentioned before, we had known of this by word of mouth down through the generations, but to have it authenticated in writing made it even more real. George for a long time and, and the funny thing is I think I knew him as a doodler before all these other things. Um, but that I kind of doodled at that time too so it was a good connection. But George is a farmer, a veteran, a storyteller all the time. Um, and tonight he's going to give us some um, good stories, right? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We've sort of heard a legend about moody lights. We've also um, heard some connections and we hear about a Granville Moody and George will tell it all. So welcome George Johnson. treaties with the Indians, each time taking some more land and then disregarding the treaties. They just, 10 o'clock line, they drew a line up this and we just take up to that line. And we come across here 14 times and each time they did, as soon as they got close enough to cross over, they crossed over and forgot all about the treaty. Naturally, they had trouble with the Indians. <clears throat> well. Simon Kenton, I'm going to tell a little more about them because I think it was pretty important. He came to this country, this Kentucky country, about four years before the revolution. He thought he'd killed a man, and he came to the frontier to keep from getting his neck in the woods. <laughs> anyway, that's what he thought. And uh, while he was living here, in those extra four years, there was hardly any other white people at all. Uh, he got to know the way of the Indians, <clears throat> and he got to know how they did, and he got to be, well, he, he was a woodsman anyway, but he could track and he could do things like just like the Indians, and he could mimic their calls, and he was good. So. Uh, 
He became a scout and a spy for General George Rogers Clark when he uh, took Kaskaski and then Vincennes. He was with them, and one of the buddies was uh, uh, Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone had a lot to do with with uh, advancing the Kentucky and Ohio, as well as uh, Simon Kenton. Simon Kenton probably had more to do, but Simon Kenton, somebody said, didn't have as good a press agent. He didn't, <laughs> he didn't want to know that who he was. As a matter of fact, he changed his name to, to Simon Butler. I was always trying to say Simon Simon <laughs> Gertie, but it wasn't Simon Gertie. Simon Gertie was not on the other side, and he was a pretty bad guy. <laughs> he was a, a leader of the early white Kentucky settlers in actions against the Indians and in defending the settlers' homes and forts from the Indians. He was a good contemporary friend of Daniel Boone and saved Daniel's life once by shooting the Indian that was just about to tomahawk Daniel and then picked Daniel up and carried him into the fort. My wife is a direct descendant of Simon Kent. Of course, that makes all my children descendants too. <laughs> and I got one more than you have. <laughs> one more extra. Because, uh, our, we have great grandkids that are that are Simon's descendants. Well, you're faster than I am, George. <laughs> <laughs> you started out, start out sooner. I've been going longer. <laughs> the government owned up, opened up the land for the settlers, and after each of the 14 treaties, the settlers moved in, often from their earlier frontier homesteads, for one reason or another. Just as soon as they could, they moved in. Well, even the... Uh, uh, Parkinson's from Urbana, they, they had settled, that was, a, that opened up a little earlier, and they'd settled that, and then they come to Indiana when it opened up. I don't know, because the land was cheaper, was it better? My estimation, the Mad River country was pretty good. I don't know what they had, but anyway, by 1838, the Indians had been pushed back into the Kankakee Marsh. That's an error. <coughs> area about 20 or 30 miles wide, stretching from South Bend, Indiana, to near Moments, Illinois. It is ponds and was wet with dangerous muckland, tall cattails and swamp grasses, a few sand hills and scrub oak trees, and was nearly impossible to cross. The early settlers considered it to be worthless. Anything with milk might well as uh, anything that wasn't drained, and even the flat country out there, like on 114 east of town, that's so beautiful now, was so level that <laughs> it wouldn't drain and it wouldn't get dry enough to farm until you got time to <coughs> shock oats. So uh, it wasn't worth much <coughs> until they got it drained. <coughs> the water was held in the swamp by the glacial moraine. <coughs> That's that ridge that uh, formed the south bank of the marsh and outcroppings of rock across the Kankakee River near Moments and across the Iroquois River at Rensselaer, Indiana. If you go along the Pinkamink River, <coughs> you see uh, that was drained through rock. This isn't dirt on the side of the bank, it's rock. Where they drug it and, uh, the marsh was the last place east of the Mississippi River that the Indians were free and on their own. They put a question mark after that on their own, and, and they're free too. They were moved out of the marsh by the government to the west of the Mississippi to reservations in one of, one of the Trail of Tears in 1838. The Parkinson's came here, she said in 36, but my book says 37. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think actually they, you're right. Oh. Well, I know. I mean, they came to... to <clears throat> well, they didn't come until came. after Simon died. And Simon came. died in the spring of 36. Mm -hmm. That's that's on record. 
But I think John came before. He came ahead because Daniel didn't come for him. Well, I wasn't saying that this way. <laughs> I said the family. That's what I meant. The family. When they came. Yeah. I think it was 30, 36. I know that they went down to Kentland, Barclays, Mr. Barclay and John Parks, and went down to Kentland in 38 to uh, and paid for their ground. And uh, kind of interesting, too, you can imagine this uh, office where they was getting the work done. There probably was a man working here on a table, a man working here on a big stack of stuff, forms up on top because imagine Barclay and Parkson was in this line and uh, Mr. Parkson got the first one and his, his number was 11 9 I believe that is it. Anyway, it was a 97. And then the next guy took one on the middle, and then Mr. Barkley was behind Mr. Parks, and his was 9.99. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting to imagine that anyway. <clears throat> they, they were moved out of the marsh by the government to west of the Mississippi to reservations. The ridge was made by the glacier pushing dirt and rocks ahead of it of the glacier ice like a huge bulldozer until the ice melted faster than it was moved south, leaving the debris in a long ridge across Jasper County. It's just a long ridge and just pulled like a huge bulldozer. And it's, it's not perfectly straight. These extensions out and then these extensions back, uh, valleys back so that it uh, it isn't exactly straight, and it's cornered. The glacier was here about 15,000 years ago. Uh, we know that. I mean, we already, I've already read that in the books, but then when Bill Jackson was digging their well on the ridge north of town for their house up here, and the chips, uh, they found some good solid wood chips from about 125 feet down. <laughs> And the chips were carbon dated at 15,435 years old. And the only logical explanation for the wood being down that deep was that it had been buried by the glacier. <coughs> on our, we live on the ridge too, and we dug, dug a well right on the top of it uh, since we've been there. And we had to go down 125 feet before we hit a rock. It's about the same as it did there. Now, you think, my gosh, that's almost deep compared to down here. <coughs> but the, the Barclay Church steps is exactly level with the tip top of the courthouse of Consider. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how much it is, just 100 feet up. Uh, so you see, <coughs> that's something that you didn't re realize. But that, that ridge is pretty prominent when you go north of town and go across the old onion farm, you used to call it. and then get out there the subdivision. The, the moraine ridge was probably park-like <coughs> with thick, tall oak and hickory trees with grapevines and with patches of bluegrass around the water ponds and near the lower edges of the ridge. Grass sod leaves black soil and timber leaves lighter colored soil. And from this, the early vegetation can be known. In other words, where the timber was, it'd be a little lighter colored soil. And that, that's just not the way it's made. The moraine soil was rocky, but had good water springs. A spring just <coughs> out of the Barclay Church <coughs> was used for water for the threshing engine until about 1925. They're up to the end of the threshing machine steam engine. There was good timber for buildings, rail fences, fuel, and even tools. I helped tear down a big barn built by Big Ed Parkinson. That was Debbie Kay's next brother that had a buggy shed on one end. The floorboards of this buggy shed <coughs> were the width of the 16-foot shed long, three inches thick, and random width. One was 23 inches wide without a knot. 
That hat comes from a huge burrow tree. Uh, incidentally, my friend over in Illinois had built a new house and he had a, wanted a ramp, a, a banister beside of the, the steps going up from, from to the floor level. Just a little. So he come over and cut one of them up. We cut it in two and he took it home. That saw got hot. Boy, it got hot. <laughs> it was just, that was just as near as something like iron as anything in nature that I know of. <laughs> and after they got that polished and down to the wood, you know, down to the wood, clean and nice, that a beautiful piece of wood. <clears throat> I didn't lose my place. Okay. There was good timber for buildings, rails, fences, and even tools. Right? Oh, yeah. The floorboards were. I've done that too. <laughs> <laughs> I need a finger stuffer. Come from a huge burrow tree. Yeah, all right. The big Ed Parkinson house, this is the same house that the barn I was telling you about. I helped tear that down too. It was built by framing of heavy timber, just like an old barn frame, with pegs and mortises, mortises and then pegs in, and uh, with the wooden pegs. And the studding must have been warped, must have been green, because they straightened the curves out by cutting a saw nearly through the concave side of the curve. Mm -hmm. They saw in almost through it and then drive a wedge in and when they drove the wedge in and they pull that right back. When we got the lath and the plaster off, you could take a hammer and go like that and yeah, that's, that's kitchen wood, because <laughs> it just broke in pieces. <laughs> the house rafters were made of poles. They were squared only on the top side, just flattened out on the top side, and on the ends. And the rest of them was round, and they still had the bark on it. And uh, the sheeting boards were sawed from the log, uh, but the edges, they were just just one inch thick, but the, the edges weren't square, and they were just however they went. For uh, wooden shingles, that, that was, didn't make any difference. That was all right. We thought we could pull the frame down when we hooked the tractor to the frame and pulled, but when we hooked the tractor to the frame and pulled, it stayed square and just followed the tractor. <laughs> 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 out of there before we could pull the darn thing. <clears throat> the Moraine's bluegrass was some of the world's best pasture because it had minerals brought by, the, brought by the glacier from many places and mixed together. Uncle Granville Moody told me that a three-year-old horse brought from the Francisville Prairie pasture and put on the ridge pasture would start to grow again. The ridge also had less mosquitoes and insects and was less subject to prairie fires and it was just plain healthier. The bluegrass could be plowed or the trees could be cut and burned and the stumps cultivated around easier than the heavy prairie sod could be plowed. I plowed some native sod about 1950 down in the south end of our farm. The sod was so tough that we had to put two tractors on the same size plow, otherwise we just sat there. <laughs> it didn't dig in, it just we all went around and nothing happened. The sod roots were matted together <coughs> when they turned over. They were matted together very much like this cocoa mat that the, 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 the roots are just all tangled up, just one solid mass of nothing but roots. And it lasted five years before it was rotted enough not to plug up the corn picker rolls. Get a hunk of that in between the rolls, and it wouldn't go up, wouldn't go down, wouldn't go out. It's plugged up, and you had to crawl out, and dig it out. It start was lots of fun, a lot of cuss words. Very <laughs> 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 settlers didn't have very good steel plows, and they probably lacked the horsepower to plow some of the toughest sod. <clears throat> and it wasn't worth the darn anyway until they got uh, drained. The flat prairie was too wet until it was drained. I was checking it in Annapolis for the this hundred year family farm program that they a while back and came across two tracks that John Graham Parkinson had bought that are way out of the flats. I just couldn't figure out why he bought them so far away until I came home and 
locked them up, looked them up on the tackle. They were both higher sandy mounds that were dry and could be plowed easily. Well, you know where Moody Road is. One of the not one of the tracks was where Fletcher lives on 114, and the other one was a knob that Bob Stewart lived on, where the farm progress show was. They were lighter colored, I mean lighter soil, and they were easier to plow, and they were drier, so he could use them, and that's why he bought them apparently. But it looked like he could find better ground earlier in the closure of the home. There had been an Indian trail along the ridge for years, and the early settlers made use of the trail for a road and settled along it. I found three nice Indian knives or spear points on the east bank of a water pothole near the trail. One point was of the Paleo area, era, 8,000 to 12,000 BC. That was the oldest, and one from the Archaic era, and one from the Hopewell era, each dealt. Uh, good evidence that the trail had been used a long time. Moody Road now follows closely to that trail, and bending around wet and muddy places and crossing streams and shallow, at shallow and hard bottom places. Originally, there were 18 jobs between Francisville and Rensselaer. If you study the terrain near the jobs that remain, you'll know why the job was there. A good example is out by Brown Cemetery, where it comes in jogging around Brown Cemetery. Well, over that way is a heck of a hole, and over this way is a metal one just like it. And halfway up and down is some of that blue, sticky gumbo clay that's worse than any tar you ever got into your life. So they stayed on top. There had been an Indian trail along the ridge for years, and the early settlers made use of the trail for road and settled dwellers. I don't know when the Parkinsons met the Henry Barclays, but I've been told since that they knew him in Ohio. Is that right, mm -hmm. Marshall? Mm -hmm. John Graham Parkson, whose wife was Matilda Kenton, now this is the oldest daughter of Simon Kenton, by Simon Kenton's second wife. Now he had another wife that had four other children, I think. Came from Ur near Urbana, Ohio where Simon Kenton died and stopped in, they stopped in White County for a while while they decided where to settle. They were told to go north past the grove of trees that had hanging branches <laughs> to the next ridge and that would be a good place. The water oaks and pin oaks found in wet places have drooping branches. That probably was how Hanging Grove Township got its name. The ridge at the Barclay Church is level with the top of the courthouse in Rensselaer. John Graham Parkson and Henry Barclay families came together and settled on the Moraine Ridge in 1837. Parkinson's bought the 160 acres southwest quarter section 6, township 29 north, range 5 west, on top of and on the south slope of the ridge and build a log cabin near the middle of the west side. The section next west was section one of range six and had been set aside by the government for the Wabash and Erie Canal Company and was not for sale. So Henry Barclay skipped section one over <coughs> to the next section west and bought the southeast quarter of section two, township 29 north, range six west. They both bought a lot more land later. <laughs> William Kenton Parkson was a teenage boy when the Parkinsons came, and the Barclays had a teenage girl, Mary Waters Barclay. By the time the two were married, section one was for sale, <laughs> and the Barclays bought the west half, and the Parkinsons bought the east half, and built a house on it. They had a large family of boys and one girl, Mary Jane Parkinson. The house was once a post office, and travelers frequently stopped there. <laughs> Mrs. Parkson said she always had set two extra plates at mealtime. Uh, the house was about halfway between Francisville and Rensselaer on Moody Road. The house that W.K. Parkson built is still standing, but has been added on to. 
The original park has solid walls. The kitchen, you can't put insulation in, Marcia. <laughs> And, and a basement with a secret compartment. I don't know if you knew that or was it there? I don't think so. My brother sure knew it. I would have. I wasn't know that. You've got to remember that all of these stories have been handed down, sometimes right. two or three. You now, and you have an older person to tell it. My grandfather was only about two when I was, you know, the well, underground. I thought it was a I'm not sure who told me it was either Uncle Van or Nanny, and she'd be 120 now or something like that. <laughs> Old timers called the road, uh, oh, original part of the walls and the basement with a secret compartment where, where all slaves on the Underground Railroad could be hidden. <coughs> Maybe they hid under the barn, I don't know. But I thought it was under the steps, <coughs> the, going out of the basement on the back. That's what I understood. No, I never... Yeah. Maybe it was pretty well hidden. Maybe it was, it was slavery really safe. <laughs> Old timers called the road now named 100 West. Named 100 West, Canada Lane, because slaves escaped north and could set up. The original Granville Moody was one of those travelers that stopped at the Debbie K. Parkinson house. He was a traveling minister and had been a full colonel in command of a regiment of volunteers from Ohio during the Civil War. After the Civil War, the government gave land as a bonus to the soldiers. Maybe a 40-acre tract to privates and a larger tract to higher rank soldiers. The higher the rank, the more they got. May, uh, the tracts were often the less desirable land that had been passed up by the settlers that, that bought land. I believe some of the land just north of the Parkson House, across the ridge, in the edge of the Kankakee Marsh, was some land given to Colonel Granville Moody. There's areas of muck land on those tracks the, and wet. Undrained muck land was considered worthless back then. Colonel Granville Moody's son, also named Granville Moody, there was three of them in a row, was a bookkeeper in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, he came with his father to inspect the land and they stayed at the parks of the house, as many travelers did. The son, Granville Moody, met the Parkson's only daughter, who was Mary Jane Parkson, and they called her Jenny. And they were married January 19, 1876. They lived in a small house just north, well, it was about a mile north of the W.K. Parkson's house. Anyway, it's in the next section. Uh, on some of the Moody land. After about 10 years, they built a new big house just across the road, Moody Road, from the Parsons' house and just a little bit west. That's where uh, Uncle Van used to live. I, I never knew the middle of Granville Moody. About half of their family were born in the new house. The new Moody house was built about 1887. It had four big rooms and a large pantry down and four large rooms up. It had a porch across the front with banisters, except in front of the front door. It was painted white with a white picket fence around the yard. Plenty of room for family and help, and the Moody's also <coughs> used lots of help that lived in neighboring houses. The house made a beautiful picture, setting up on the crest of the ridge with green grass pasture lots in front and a curved lane that led up to the hill, led up the hill to the farmstead, where were several barns, a crib, and the cattle sorting pens, <coughs> and later a huge cement silo. The silo and the big crib are all that remain. Mrs. Moody died in 1916, and Mr. Moody lived until 1936, which was still during the Great Depression of 1929. Wasn't over yet. It was getting better, but long ways from being well. There was no electricity until about 1938 in Jasper County rural homes. Water was pumped by windmills into big stock tanks and for the cattle <coughs> and into some, fly, some supply tanks in the attics of some of the more advanced houses. Toilets were outside and whenever it comfortable with cold weather, 
<laughs> very pleasant because of the flies and warm weather. <laughs> Down in southern Illinois, I remember going water with a bucket tied to a rope over a pulley for a lot of stock. The cool water was poured through a tank in the well house, and that was the only refrigeration that we had to keep the food and milk cool. It was a terribly hard job, and in the summer, the stock drank and drank and drank and drank and <laughs> their sides stuck out. In winter, they didn't drink so much, but the darn wet rope chapped my hands until they cracked and bled. I'll always say that the best thing that electricity had changed was how water was handled on the farm. Before <coughs> electricity, house lights were kerosene and outside kerosene lanterns were used. Fires were often started by accidents with the lamps or lanterns. The house I live in is the third house on that same foundation. The other two burned. You almost burned one herself. Oh. And got some walnuts in the stove and you got some damn on it. <laughs> the jacket on the outside was red hot. No foam, no nothing. We just sweat. That's the scariest I ever was and couldn't do it. Don't think about it. The more you shut it off, the hotter it got. Granddad Moody looked after the land and handled lots of cattle. Most of his land was left in pasture and he bought, bought corn to feed and finish them from the neighbors. He was like a, more like a uh, feed mill, <laughs> I mean an uh, elevator than most barns. At one time he had 999 head. Someone asked him why he didn't make it a thousand. Ah, he said, ah, a hundred head, a thousand head of cattle is just too many for one man. <laughs> <laughs> He bought cattle from Chicago, Denver, St. Louis, and Texas, and shipped them by rail into Pleasant Ridge, about four miles south, and drove them to the farm. After the Gifford Railroad was built, they sometimes used the Moody Station, about two miles east on Moody Road, just east of the Brown Cemetery as a shipping point. They were, they were grown on pasture, fed and fattened, and then drove to market at the same stations. Pasture on this ridge is the strongest and best I know of. Uh, I'm going to stop there a little bit. This bluegrass pasture on this moraine, the ground came from a little bit from here, a little bit from there, and a little bit from the other place, mixed it all together, and when it got up here and left it, it was some of everything in here. Uncle, Uncle uh, Van told me that a three-year-old horse brought from the Francisville Prairie put on this pasture would, would start growing again. And that's, uh, I know that they couldn't raise bean soup over at Francisville until they found out that what they had, what they had to put on was potash. It was potash that highly soluble and that was so wet that it was just gone. And they just, they just didn't do it. It grew grass such as it was, but it wasn't worth a hoop. The stock would starve to death and cram them full of it. You digress a little bit more. People that know about livestock have heard about Mineral Point, Wisconsin, as being such a wonderful pasture area. Well, the, the idea is exactly the same. It's a moraine that, that uh, the glacier dumped there. But we've got 200 more miles south, so we got that much longer. Uh, yeah, summertime. <laughs> I've made appraisals in eight states, so I know a little bit about it. <clears throat> they, they tell a story about Grandfather Moody buying a crib of corn. The crib was not completely full and varied in depth, so they agreed that Granddad would take a hole and strike where he thought the average level should be, and they would measure down from there. But as he started to hit with the hole, he stubbed his toe and hit a lot higher than he should have. <laughs> he said, I agreed to measure from where I hit, and so he paid for too much corn. <laughs> Granddad Moody lived when cars were first beginning to be used instead of horses and buggies. He had a big hop on bill, which he hardly ever shifted out of second gear. I'll agree to that. <laughs> <laughs> Ridden with him. <laughs> 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 
someone asked him, <laughs> someone asked him why he didn't, and he said, oh, I just like to hear it home. <laughs> <laughs> he was a founder and director of the State Bank of Rensselaer, one of the few banks that stayed open during the Great Depression in 1929. That was only about three or four of them in the whole state that did. Granddad Moody and his wife were charter members of the Barclay Methodist Church, which started in 1886. His father, Colonel Granville Moody, did dedicated the church. The church lasted exactly 100 years. Some of the members had an idea about the church that Granddad thought was a good idea, so he told them to raise half the money and he would match it. They went right away and got the first half from Mrs. Moody. <laughs> Mary Moody Dunn, that is my, the oldest Moody child of the family, was my mother-in-law. She told of many things that happened while she was a child. She told of playing and swinging on grapevines in the thick woods of the marina. <coughs> she told of being left to care for her siblings while her mother went down the road to take care of Mary's sick grandmother. She said she was sure that her nose got permanently flattened by pressing her nose against the window pane to see if her mother was ever coming home yet. <laughs> she said she couldn't understand why she, her father didn't bring home the land when he bought uh, land he bought like he brought home the cattle he bought. <laughs> she wasn't very open. <laughs> she said the pain of her life was when the family was just getting into the buggy. Uh, when someone would write up and say, Mr. Moody, you have a steer bogged down in the muck. So, of course, the trip was called off while the father went to rescue the steer. Mary was 16 years older than her baby brother, also named Granville Moody. He was engaged to be married, but his fiance died suddenly from appendicitis and he never did marry. He was an excellent judge of cattle and worked <coughs> with his father with the cattle. After his father died, he left the house to deteriorate, but that did a lot of things that were very, very unusual. But he could put a bunch of cattle by him, and he could <coughs> spend in three pounds of what their average was. And they'd be right. I mean, he didn't need to scale, really. Mm -hmm. Granddad Moody had a lot of high-priced cattle on hand when the Great Depression of 1929 dropped the price of cattle to nearly nothing. Had he not been a good manager and had a lot of savings, he probably would have lost some of his land. But when he died in 1936, he left each of his four girls a good-sized farm, and the main farm was left to his son. Vandal stole the fine furnishings from the home and finally burned it down. Many wild stories are told about the son Granville, nicknamed Van Moody. Some were true. Most were not. The junction of Moody Road and Meridian Road is a place where most St. Joseph College students <coughs> go on dates to watch the Moody Road lights. The junction is much higher than Highway 49, but it is directly south. <coughs> and but the two miles uh, between is low muck land, where fog often forms when none forms in other places. So uh, lights from cars coming down 49 are affected by the fog. You can't even see the lights. The fog is blanking out, and the lights will bounce, bounce from one to the other. And then all of a sudden, when it gets, it take off that way, it take off that way, and that's the end of it. Well, it gets to 14, and it's got to do that or jump in the ditch. So, <laughs> but then that makes for lots of imagination. <laughs> Lights from cars coming down 49 are affected by the fog, and when the car turns right or left on Highway 14, the lights disappear, which makes for wild imagination and wild stories. And the stories get stretched. Maybe some of the stories have a little truth to them. One story is about a man being murdered and buried, with his family still wandering about at night <coughs> with the lights looking over his grave, looking for his grave. There's a little truth to that, but the murder was over 100 years ago and not in the same location. We've been selling gas, pulling cars out of the mud, directing people how to get back to school for over 50 years now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll have to go on back.
Back in the old days when somebody said not to do something like he meant it. And so Big Ed Parkson would be her great uncle. There's a neighbor boy or that hanging around his daughter and they didn't like him. He told him not to come around. But he did. And, uh, he disappeared. <laughs> it cost him quite a bit to get out of it, but uh, that's all right. I did what I said I wanted to That's uh, that's one of the stories. And oh, they get an awful lot of stretched out stories on the imagine the wildest imagination you can think of. Uh, almost impossible. But that's 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 the whole story. Is, uh, <coughs> that muck fog forms in there and the lights you can't see them. But you can see the light in the in the fog, and it bounces from one to the other, sort of like a mirrors and stuff. It's it's complicated as that. In my 81 years, I've seen many changes in farming, probably more than most people, because I've lived in three entirely different sections of the United States and worked for four years out west in five states as an appraiser and farm manager, plus four years in the army. I was born in southeastern Missouri, about a half a mile from Arkansas, where cotton was king and the farms were small. Maybe 40 <coughs> acres of support the family, with only a team of mules, a wagon, a one mule double shovel, cultivator, and lots of hard work, hard hand work by the whole family, hoeing cotton and picking cotton by hand. Now that was about the same deal that the Parkinson's, when they came into down in that country, you had open stock law, you turn your cow out, you didn't have to worry about pasture, you had to worry about the fencing to keep them out of your cotton. And this up here, they had plenty of pasture, but then they were small, and then, but can you imagine when Parkinson come, coming in a couple of wagons, with the two families, uh, Barclays with maybe four wagons, and each of those wagons had about the same volume as a pickup truck. Three by nine by a foot. And if it had sideboards, it was two feet. In other words, it would be 27 cubic feet or 54. <clears throat> Can you imagine just coming there and not being able to go to the store and get the doll darn thing and for Lord knows when. You either had to make it, or you had to fire, you had to do your own farm making if you had to. Well, <laughs> that, that's, that's all it was. You just had to make it because you didn't have anything in. And that wagon had to have not only your stuff, which consisted mostly of the whack, the axe, the butcher knife, maybe the saw. And uh, they, didn't, they wouldn't bother bringing uh, seal wedges. They would bring, they'd make their own wooden wedges. <coughs> But the other half of it, I only had, had to have mom's stuff. I had to have her dishes, and I had to have a big uh, package of flour or some sort of keg or something like that, and uh, pails and a uh, big iron kettle. That was the main thing that they did most of their cooking and their butchering and their, their uh, canning and all that kind of washing and all that kind of stuff. And they had to have Mm -hmm. They made pails, they made uh, <coughs> barrels with wooden hooks. They made them right there. They had to have something. But they needed the what they needed more than anything else was a blade. That would have just uh, it would be just about subsistence, about the same as those people were down there in, in, uh, in the foothills in, Ar in Missouri and Arkansas. <coughs> then, well, I'm going to cut this short. My first recollection of agriculture was riding on my mother's cotton sack and playing and napping in the cotton wagon where the cotton wagon was, where the cotton was weighed with stilliard scales and dumped in the cotton was dumped in the cotton wagon. I made a good place to sleep. <laughs> I got sleep. My father got killed when I was barely four. Mother kept us together for three years. Then I moved to southern Illinois and put us kids out in foster homes. I went to Fred Bobbitt in Fairfield and lived there for the last five years of grade school. 
Mr. Bobbitt had been sick and could only stand about an hour to show me how to do things. Then he had to go back to the house. His farm was 140 acres of pasture for about 25 cattle of various ages, a flock of 30 sheep and three horses, and I worked the road. A main crop of 30 or 40 acres of red top hay that was thrashed for seed, and maybe 10 acres of corn that was cut and shopped and used for winter, winter feed. I know how that was done, too. Uh, for the cows and maybe a few acres of cowpea hay for the sheep's winter feed. The soil was very acid, it produced very little to limestone and commercial fertilizer was used. These were just beginning to be used when I left in 1929. He, we hauled lots of manure, but just wasn't enough. Well, but even so, that was a lot better than that 40 acres down in Arkansas. <coughs> it was another step further, that was about like another generation. And uh, they had more stock, just like your grandfather. And uh, <coughs> that kind of went along. I mean, I, I seen, actually had experience with some of the same same thing. And then later, when I left there in 29, I went up north. That's where everybody else went when they wanted a job. I hadn't passed the age grade yet, incidentally. <laughs> so, uh, I didn't want to take it over, and my darn if I was going to take it over, so I went up north and didn't, didn't go to school for a while. But I managed to get through a year and a half of high school, and then I was out a year and a half, and I went back and finished up, and then I got a chance to go to college, and I got like I got a diploma in college. <laughs> Down in the corner it says with high honors, even though I didn't pass the age grade. <laughs> 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 Was there a question or two? I know we're running short of time. Um, okay. Up there in the lower area, they've got a Buckley Homestead in that area. Of the, of the I can't hear where it was. Buckley Homestead. Are they related to this? Buckley Homestead? No, it's Buckley. Oh. Buckley instead of Barkley. Oh, I assume. Buckley. You know, she was recalling in the lower area, there's a Buckley homestead and she was wondering if it's related to the Barclays no. or any of them. The Barclays family seemed to have <clears throat> went out when they got to be of age. They, they didn't stay on. they stayed they didn't stay around. They went to Kansas City. <laughs> and then generally they didn't even bother to write back. <laughs> oh, they, my. They, they won, the youngest one that went to state was the one that stayed, and, 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 and he was another in the park. But the park shows now, big into them, seem to have stayed around more. They settled and, and uh, well, guys from our place, from our square, from 100 and from 14 all the way to Pleasant Ridge, it's hanging near all Barclays or parks and land at one time. They had a job of it. They were lucky. Well, we're lucky to have George and to have had Marsha. We thank you.